So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Thomas Hill. He's professor of psychology at the University of Warwick, <coughs> and is also director of the Behavioral and Data Science Master Program mm -hmm. there. Uh, he's also a former fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, and you're also a research fellow at the Royal Society. Uh, and Thomas has a broad range of interests, and some of them he's going to talk about today. I just want to mention one thing, and it's that and he has a new book coming out right now about uh, behavioral, uh, um, what is it called, behavioral network science. And, and uh, this is a wonderful book, and it's about how, um, yeah, how structure matters in behavioral science. Please use the mic. We are recording. So I'm not recording at all. It yeah. might not be such a bad idea. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Maybe I can do this again then. It's with great pleasure. Huh? <laughs> Second take. Second take as usual, the best one. So, uh -huh. <clears throat> yeah, so it's with great pleasure uh, for me to introduce you. Uh, professor Thomas Hills from the University of Warwick. He's a professor of psychology. He's also the director of the uh, Master Science Master Program for uh, Behavioral and Data Science. Is a former fellow of the Alan Turing Institute and also fellow, a research fellow of the Royal Society. And I just want to plug his new book, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, which is, uh, now I get this right, um, Behavioral Network Science, Language, Mind, and Society. And the book is about how and why structure matters in behavioral science. It's a great book. I encourage you all to read it and also use it in your courses and and uh, uh, as an inspiration. And I know now that we're going to do a little bit of a game here. And I hand it over to Thomas to uh, explain to you what we're about to do. All right, thanks, thanks, Henry. Yeah, that's right. Um, so one of the things I definitely know is that you'll remember more what you do during my talk than, than what I do. Um, and so, so I'm inviting you to, to play a little game really quickly. So hopefully you've somewhat semi-organized yourself into groups of four people. All I need you, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You can do it, you can do it on the fly. You just look at each other and decide you're a group of four. You're gonna come up and your group of four is each gonna take a little, piece, a little stack of chips here. Okay, so first come up and do that. So find yourself a group of four, come up here. Only take from a little group, okay? Yeah. So just take one stack of chips for each person in the group. So I take one group of four. One group of four. That's right, take, take one stack of chips for each person in your group. For each person, One stack for each person in your group. Four stacks. And now we can gamble them. So, uh, uh, are you, each are you, person gets a stack. Each person in your group gets one stack of those chips. So how many chips in a stack? I'll tell you once you go back to your, to your thing. Okay, this one has six. This yes, has that's right. You got it? So we have, uh, I have three. Someone must have taken an extra set. Um, go, go back to your, to your here. Here's an, here's an extra. One of four. Is there, you need a fourth? I can be in your group. Are you, do you have a group of four? Okay, here you go. Here, you can take these ones. Let me explain the rules before you start. Okay, everybody's in a group of four? Hopefully. If, Yep. Yeah, each person needs a stack. There's three more stacks here. Yeah. So there you go. Oh, you got it. Okay. You're in your group. There should be two people with six chips and two people with four chips. Okay. Make sure that's true. Count your chips. Each group. Two people should have four chips and two people should have six chips. I have zero. I thought it was a. How much do you have? We have the four by. I have four. Okay. You have four? Two people in your group should have six chips, and two people should have four chips. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> I'm pretty sure I counted right. <laughs> Maybe it's okay. Am I in your group? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, these are the rules. This is very simple. I, I, I suspect that many of you have not played a collective action game before in real life, so I'm, you're going to right now. Um, this is the rules. There are three rounds, only three. Don't talk with anyone in your group. You cannot talk, okay? You can contribute zero, one, or two chips each round. That's all. Zero, one, or two chips each round to the public share. So decide there's some spot in the group that's going to be the public share, some table or something like that. Put your chips in your hand like this. Hold them out. Everybody holds them out at the same time. And then you reveal what you have and put them in the collective. That's going to be the collective pool. You can think of that as the money that you're spending to reduce greenhouse gases. OK? So if your group reaches 11 chips in the public share by the end, you can keep whatever chips you still have. Each individual can keep their chips if you reach 11 in the center by the end. Is that clear? OK. Chips are worth everything. These are like your eyeballs. OK? They're your children. Don't waste them. This is the money you go home with to, to, to buy your children food and things like that. OK? So don't just give it away. It's not free. I know this isn't incentivized. When we do this in the laboratory, it's always incentivized. So people leave with money that they keep. OK? So you should act, pretend, anyway, that it's incentivized. If you don't collectively reach the threshold, then all members of your group lose everything. OK? So whatever you have left in your hand, you don't, you, you lose. So Everybody? The doesn't get redistributed or anything like that? Nope, nope. And we're just going to play it once, three rounds, and I'll tell you when round one is, which is going to be now. OK? So prepare for round one. So, so do we know uh, how much is being collected uh, at the end of each round? Yes, you'll see it, because everyone's going to reveal. Okay. Yeah? All right? Are you ready? Yeah. Say again? I have four chips. Yeah, I have four chips. I have six. OK, yeah. So also, also, I've said, just to be clear, there is inequality. Some people are rich, and some people are poor. Yeah? OK, good. All right. <laughs> You're poor, aren't you? <laughs> I'm, I'm also poor. <laughs> OK, so here we are. Round one, put your hand out with your chips in it so that everyone in your group can see and reveal. OK, so let's just put those here. OK, but this is the one you're giving. OK, so now you can see what's in the group. Yeah? All right, that was round one. Everybody good? OK, so now we do round two. <laughs> you can just do it when you're ready. Just do round two when you're ready. All right? You're giving it all away. How many do we have? It's nine. How many do you have left? Just one. OK. All right, here we go. Last round, and go. Oh. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Everybody done round three? Go ahead and do round three then. Yeah. Sorry? No, no, no. That's, you just have whatever's left. OK. How many groups succeeded? You succeeded. You succeeded. You succeeded. Did you guys succeed? You, everybody succeeded. You're only in two rounds you succeeded. Wow. You also succeeded. Did these guys succeed? It was too easy. I made it too easy. Nice. Did you succeed? Yeah, OK, good. OK. Thank you, everyone, I think, for doing that. I, I, this is a, <laughs> it needed to be harder, I think, because everyone succeeded. But 
hopefully the processes that are going on in your head, hopefully the, the things you're thinking about while you're doing it are things you can sort of carry through this talk, right? Because this is the kind of thing we're asking people to do in this presentation are just like this. So, <laughs> this worked, that was it. That was it. And it wasn't. See, look what I've done. <laughs> OK, I'll talk now. <laughs> you can just keep the chips for now. Don't worry about it. Or put them here, yeah. OK, so, so um, I do lots of different things. I work on search behavior, and I work on the structure of memory across the lifespan, and these kinds of things. But what I want to show you today is stuff we're doing with collectives lately, um, largely led by uh, Eugene Malthaus, who's here, this character here. So he's, no, that's not right, uh, that button. So Eugene, um, he organized this group of 70-odd people around the world. Um, and by the end, I'll show you a task that's very much like the one you just did. But I'll show you some other tasks in the meantime. So. Um, how many, if, uh, the allegory of the long spoons is something I really like, right? So the allegory of the long spoons is basically the following. It's basically that in hell, everyone has really short arms, and the spoons are really long, and there's all the food you can eat, right? So all the food you can eat, but your arms are really short, and the spoons are really long, and so it's a struggle to eat, right? In, in heaven, Say again, in heaven, it's the same thing, but people feed each other. Yeah? So this is the allegory of the long spoons. And you can see sort of two different kinds of worlds here. And um, let's see here. Yeah, so this is Robert Putnam. He's the guy who wrote uh, Bowling Alone, right? So the downfall of sort of civic communities in America. But he's also talked about it in other places as well, like, for example, in Italy, where he talks about basically two different kinds of worlds. There's one world where you've got social capital and trust, and these are self-reinforcing. There's virtuous circles of cooperation, and et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other side, which in this case, southern Italy is painted in red here. I, these are, this is not my, I didn't make these distinctions. He made these distinctions. But the other side, you've got uncivic communities. Right? So you've, these are also self-reinforcing. So there's defection, and people don't trust each other. And then how do you build sort of communities when you've got these kinds of problems? So two broad equilibria towards which all societies tend to evolve and which tend to be self-reinforcing. And you can think of these as sort of in classroom sort of Western philosophy as sort of like a Hobbesian war of all against all. We need society in order, and rules in order to make sure that we trust each other versus sort of Rousseau, man is naturally good but society corrupts us. Right? So those two kinds of things, I think those are really interesting philosophically. And then the question is, why do we even think about the world in this particular way? Is there a true answer? Is there a correct answer to this? How do our beliefs in this answer influence the kinds of actions that we take? In this case, I clearly made the game too easy because you all cooperated by the end to sort of reach the public good. But some of you will be richer and poorer so inequality will have changed, and I'll show you how it changes in, in our results as a consequence as well. So here's just a picture of ICP. I, we are sort of long spoons. Where I'm feeding you, and you'll feed me. Helga fed us earlier. Um, so some basic definitions. Uh, I, because I wasn't quite sure what this crowd would be like, I just tried to start with really basic ideas. Like in collective action problems, which is the kind of research I'm doing, there's sort of two different ways to think about it. One is there's sort of collaborative kinds of problems where we're all solving a common problem and the benefits go to everyone equally. So the, the value to the self is effectively the same thing as the value to the other. So if I give to the group, that's effectively like giving to myself. So our, our, our actions are aligned. Versus, and this is like group problem solving and coordination problems, so like team play. First is a situation where it's more competitive. And now my self-interest is not aligned with the group. Right? And so the classic problems like this are prisoner's dilemma. And I'll show you some versions of this that we ran later. Tragedy of the commons, so hardens 
uh, ideas. And uh, one of my favorites is producer scrounger game, right? So from behavioral ecology, which is where I originate, um, which is the idea that, of course, some people can work hard to produce things, and then other people can sort of steal away from that, right? Which is, which I, is, is also a really nice sort of model for thinking about human behavior. And in reality, I think few problems are purely one or the other, right? So even in cases where we might all be willing to think about a collective problem together. Some of us must, might also want to be on our phones or, or whatever. You know, that we, we might have other things in our mind or, or take it stealing from our attention. So, and there's two inherent trade-offs to this, to these different types of systems. And one is sort of in a collaborative framework, you've sort of got an exploration versus exploitation trade-off. I'll show you some examples of this in a little while. But the idea is this is the common trade-off for any search problem, right? We can all be searching in different places for the answer or we can all be searching in the same place for the answer. Right? And that sort of creates this sort of exploration, exploitation trade-off. And depending on the problem difficulty, we may want more exploration and less exploitation. Or the amount of resources may want, may want, in a particular location, we may want more exploration. Alternatively, in a competitive world, we've got a self-interest versus collective interest kind of trade-off. Right? So this is a common trade-off for any collective system where public and private goals are not aligned. So, and then you get the free rider problem. Right, the idea that someone can sort of steal away um, the value that other people are creating. So I think the problem that's sort of common to all of these, and this is, sort of, this is partly a question. So I wrote this talk partly trying to answer a question. And I don't think I really answered it, but hopefully you'll be able to help me think about it, is social influence is a powerful sort of uh, key thing, both with exploration and exploitation, and also with self versus other. And so I'll show you this. Um, I, I wrote a paper a few years ago called The Dark Side of Information Proliferation, which is how when information proliferates in society, what are the types of cognitive selective processes that cause us to choose certain kinds of information? So basically, you can think of a market of ideas, and then what are we looking for in that market when, the, when there's lots of competition in that market? And so this talks about um, one of the key components of this is social influence, which I'm unpacking here. So just going back into psychology a bit, and uh, uh, maybe it was Helga or maybe Matteo who talked a little bit about Bandura earlier. Um, so this is sort of Bandura's sort of no trial learning. So you think about what does social information give you? Gives you the opportunity to, opportunity to learn vicariously through others. So somebody else can make a mistake and you can learn from it. And this is the classic sort of Bobo doll experiment where he showed little videos of kids beating up the plastic inflated doll. And then he, he looked and he saw what they did, right? So early sort of almost qualitative kind of, uh, or very qualitative sort of psychological science. But what he, he demonstrated is that kids are really eager to do whatever the model is. So they see another kid doing it and they immediately sort of mimic this model. This is another one that's sort of classic. I think if you're talking about collective behavior, this is one you've got to know, right? This is group polarization. This is work from Solomon Ash, and the classic uh, sort of uh, example of this is you, you have a bunch of participants. In fact, only one of them is the true participant. The rest of them are stooges, right? And so you're invited into the laboratory, and you might sit, let's say, at the end of the table. Where do I have to stand in order to make this work? There. You might be this guy, and this guy over here starts first, and you're told which line of A, B, and C is the same length as this line. And this guy says, it's A. And then this guy says, it's A. And then this guy says, it's A. And then it finally gets over to you. And then the question is, what do you say in, in this situation? Right? And so what Solomon Ash demonstrated, and many others have demonstrated since him, is that this is what you do if you're by yourself. You get it right, 100% accurate. And this is what you do if you're faced with this other group of people, right? So roughly about 60% accuracy. Um, and he also looked at the different, different sizes of groups that are required to, to manipulate you. And typically, you need about three other people saying it's A for a person to say A about 60% of the time, right? Another thing I love about this research is he also asked, what if, you have enough, what if one of these other characters here says it's C, right? So says the truth. Right? And you only actually need basically one of those people. This is sort of what happens if you have one other person who agrees with you, even though your belief is the fringe 
true but fringe belief in the situation. And that actually works quite nicely. I think this is one of the issues with social proliferation. Um, if you've got lots of people sharing lots of ideas, your idea might be really wacky. But if there's another person in the world who shares your wacky idea, that's enough for you to be like, yeah, wacky is <laughs> mainstream. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, this, is, this has been replicated across societies. Different societies show different levels of, of, of influence, but they all show this, this group polarization. This is another experiment I really like. This is from Salganic Thoughts and Watts. This is the social herding experiment. And this is done um, back in the days when you could download music and it was cool to actually download a, a song for free. Right? Um, and so what they allowed people to do is they could, they could click on music and they could download it and they could listen to a song and they could sample as many of these songs as they like and then they could download the one they choose for free. And there's two conditions. One is you just do what I just said. And the other is you see what other people have downloaded before. Right, so now there's social information that's provided, and they've got quite a big sample size here, about 14,000 people doing this in multiple different chains. So after a while, there'll be you know, 100 people who've gone before you and you see what they've downloaded. And what they find is the following. So for several really cool things. So one is social groups are more unequal. So this is the Gini coefficient, and I'll show you this. How do I make this work? There we go. So here's the Gini coefficient over here. And these, all the black bars or dark bars are social groups. Here's an independent group. So this is just one person without social information. And what you can see is that all the social groups here and all the social groups here are more unequal. So they're more winner take all. It's more like the first person in the room says Taylor Swift, and then everybody else says Taylor Swift too, right? You know, this kind of thing. Um, whereas if you let people choose independently, then it's more equal distribution. So social influence drives the sort of winner take all type of process. The other thing they show, which I think is really beautiful, is that the social groups are actually less like one another. So it's, they're not really measuring quality. They're amplifying noise. So social groups, um, they have an unpredictability measure. You can see, the, look at the equation, and, and, but it's basically how similar, the, how much can you predict one social group based on another one, and the social groups are less predictable than the independent groups. So I think this is really quite nice, right, because it suggests that especially in this situation here where you might say my subjective interests are well tuned and this just says no that's not true at all right any you know star wars might have been the best film of all time but it could have just as easily been something else if that had been made and we all agreed or a few of us had agreed early on that that was the cool thing right then that could have been the best thing of all time and so you get this amplification they also did a nice study, too, where they used social information to, they reversed it about halfway through the study. So they made people effectively, they got people to choose bad music, right, by telling them that a lot of other people had chosen it, right? And then people would listen to it. And go, oh, yeah, there must be something to that, right? Um, if you listen to Bitches Brew enough time, it gets better. <laughs> um, so, but so, okay, so. That's just showing you some other people's research. I want to show you some of my research now. So this is um, some group problem solving stuff. Um, this, is, this is actually a piece that's in the book that really is largely inspired a bit by Barkoksi and, and Galasik, so Mirta's work. Um, and so they talk about rugged landscapes and smooth landscapes. And the idea is that if you've got a world where you know, things are really smooth like this versus things that, where the problem's really hard like this, and the idea is you're trying to find a peak in this space. So you can imagine that you know, this is just a, a sort of uh, visualization of more or less difficult worlds. In this world, it's easy to find a peak. You just follow the, the gradient. Right? In this one, it's hard to find the tallest peak. You're going to find basically a local maximum in that space. And so um, Wint Winter Mason, this is work with Rob Goldstone. What they did is they hooked people up into networks, like so. Uh, of different, so this one is a lattice, and this one is a fully connected network, and here's sort of a small world network down here. And the people are connected together in various social configurations, and each person guesses and receives a payoff that their neighbors can see. And then they each guess again for 10 rounds. Okay, so someone makes a guess, you can see what your neighbors did, and then you can decide to guess again. And in this case, you want to find, get as many points as you can. And so then the question becomes, which configuration is best? Right? And I've already given you a hint. It's going to depend on how smooth or rugged the world is. Right? And so what they showed is using different worlds like this. So here's where they would guess down here. So 
So this is your guess. So if you guess zero, your payoff would be zero. And if you guess 60, then your payoff may, might be about 100. Right? And over here, it's a much more bumpier world, so it's a little more rugged. And over here, they've got a world that's called the needle, right? where the, the maximum is really hard to find, uh, but it's easy for people to wind up on this sort of local maximum here. And what they showed quite nicely is that if you're in this world, so this is the easy world, then the fully connected network is best, right? Because someone's going to land on the slope somewhere, right? And then you can just follow that person, and then everybody eventually sort of crawls up to the top of the peak. Right? But if the world is hard, like this one, so if the solution is difficult to find, then you want people disconnected. Right? So then the lattice does best, which is this little guy up in the top right-hand corner here. Right? So when solutions are hard, you actually want lots of individuals working independently of one another so that they won't be influenced by the social information of others. So I think this suggests a potential solution. Right? So network problems with humans reveal a substantial amount of following, and less following is better for hard problems. And this is that Mason uh, work that I just showed you a second ago. Can you read it? It's a bit small. Um, but so uh, Mason and Watts found that when individuals' neighbors were similar to one another, individuals copied their neighbors more. So this is sometimes called complex contagion, right? So it's basically like a few of you are similar. This is almost the group, the group uh, polarization. So Solomon Ash work again, right? If a few of you are similar and you're my neighbors, then I'm more likely to follow you um, than I would if you were all different from each other. And so the Balcoxi and Galasic put it. Right? They said that basically the network structure and social learning strategies jointly affect the levels of exploration and exploitation in the population. So now they're juxtaposing strategy and structure at the same time. Right? And so when problems are hard, right, if both strategy and network promote high levels of the same activity, either exploration or exploitation, performance is likely to drop. However, if network and strategy promote opposite behaviors, performance is likely to rise. So we now use to see a difference. This is a subtlety, right? But it's an important one, which is that the strategies we use to follow one another and the structure are interact, so both process and structure. And then lastly, Campbell showed this sort of partial copying of behavior, right? um, being better for hard problems. And so what I'm sort of summarizing here is quite a bit of research. The social information leads to less exploration, but more exploration is needed for hard problems. So we can adapt the structure to the, to the environment. And here I just propose this really simple idea called, called social annealing. Right? And if any of you are familiar with the idea of simulated annealing, right, this, you can have a social annealing system too. And so with a social annealing system, what you do is you start off with everybody being independent, like so. And then you invite them to Trieste. And then you, <laughs> right? and then you have slowly bigger and bigger groups over time. Right? So you cool the network. Right? And by cooling the network now, you just connect people together over time. So it might be like sending a bunch of foraging ants out independently, right? and they're each doing their own thing. And then after a while, they come back to the nest, and then everybody sort of gets, gets the idea, and they sort of anneal together to some kind of social solution. So I just call this social annealing. I'm sure I'm not the, the only person who's ever come up with the idea, but that's what I just call it. Um, and we can take a system like this. So this is NK fitness landscape. And for those of you who know what it is, that's good. Basically, the idea is that you know, the, the n is the size of the binary genome. And the binary, so if the genome is 6, then you have six little zeros or ones in a row. right? And that's the size of the genome. And the k is the number of interdependencies between these. So this is an old idea from Stuart Kaufman, which allows you to produce a kind of world like this, where, in this case, every node has a value. Um, and you basically create a rugged landscape. So if you have n equals 5 and k equals 1, you have fewer dependencies. And then you get one sort of uh, uh, global maximum. And it's easy to reach because there's no local maximum in this one. So this is basically like the smooth world I showed you before. Right? But if you create more interdependencies like this, then you wind up with lots of local, <coughs> local maximum. And so it's less likely that you find this. And so I you just use this as an example of a hard world, right? Which we can build sort of quantitatively using this NK fitness landscape. Sorry, what's the uh, interdependency here? Is it just an edge between? So it basically means the value of a particular, you could say, base pair in the genome depends on its neighbors. Mm. And how many of its neighbors does it depend on? So if, if K is 0, 
then it only depends on itself. And if it's one, it depends on its closest neighbor. And so if you've got five base pairs in the genome and k is two, each one depends on its neighbor and you can kind of go in a circle then. Yeah? Okay, so, so this is a really nice way to sort of build a hard world. Um, and what you can do is you can... So in this case, I'm just indicating the ruggedness basically by, by the blackness, right? So blackness are peaks. <coughs> these have higher values, right? So these are local, uh, local maxima, and here's the global maxima here. So all, all these, uh, both the graphs have the same number of arrows there. That's right. Well, I don't know if they have the same number of arrows, but they have the same number of nodes. And every edge, so an edge means I can move from this genome of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 to this one because it's better. So this is like moving uphill in the gradient. That's right. That's right. An edge is just a bit flip, precisely. The, the arrow indicates that it would improve your fitness if you moved to that, right? So if your genome had that mutation, you would move from here to here, right? That would be better for you. Yeah? Sorry? That's right. You, just, you, you can arbitrarily sort of assign values to the genome, right? And then this, this is effectively just sort of pops out at the end after you create these dependencies. Yeah. So it's all sort of built into the, into the algorithm for building the world. That's exactly right. This is just a, a network visualization of that landscape, which perhaps overcomplicates it. But that, yeah, um, it just gives you an idea that you can crawl around in this genomic space. Yeah. What's a bit flip? A bit flip in this case would be I change the first base pair, let's say, from a zero to a one. As a, as a change. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So I change my genome, and that allows me to crawl around in this high-dimensional space. So if you had a strategy. Could be a behavioral strategy that sort of maps onto a genome, right? Then that would be the same way to think about this, yeah? Can we see how the fitness is defined? Right. So fitness is just assigned to a set of a set of base pairs and their dependencies. So if it's just zero, if k was zero, then every single base pair would have some randomly assigned fitness to begin with, and your total value of your genome would be each of those base pairs summed together. Fitness for, that's right, that's right. And if you've got dependencies, then that changes the number of possible, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, this, this, I just show you this as an example. This is, we're sort of got going astray, but just as an example that you can create this sort of complicated system. And then you can use different types of network structures and different types of following rules. And the idea here is that there should be a, a difficulty out there that social annealing would do better in, because what social annealing does is it starts off with everyone working independently, and so they're each sort of sampling in this high-dimensional space somewhere, and then they start sharing information. And once they start sharing information, then better people can be followed, but you can, the cooling parameter is how quickly you create edges between people. So how much do you let people share information? So if the system is really hard, then you want to cool it slowly. And if the system is really easy, you can cool it fast. Yeah. And so that's all this is showing here. And the, 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 you know, the, this is just sort of proof of the pudding, and this is really proof of principle. Right? It's just showing you, OK, so here's our fully connected network that really rapidly converges on a local minimum or local maximum. Here's our ring network, which maintains some independency over time but it eventually lands on a local minimum, and this is the result of thousands of simulations. And here is our simulated annealing um, with a particular cooling parameter. I can't quite see it here, but these little blue lines are the simulated annealing versions that eventually find the solution, right? And this is just proof of principle that you should, there should be a tuning parameter that allows you to sort of find the optimal solution in this space by cooling it sufficiently slowly. There's lots of things that are gonna be interdependent here, but I'm simply using this as an example, a sort of metaphor of the kind of following that typically happens in social systems, and here just showing you how you could use it to solve a particular, particularly hard problem. So how robust would that be if you have a little bit of noise in transmission, lack of fidelity? 
Oh, yeah, right. Transmission of information. So I'm, I'm thinking like the eigen question, for example, you know, where you you can you introduce information without with always with, with error. Mm. So that might kind of uh, Yeah, I I think that would matter. I don't know how it would matter in this particular system. So that's a good question. Yeah. I, I, this is a very minimal system. I think you could probably fool around with lots of different things, but I like that yeah, idea of, I mean, of yeah. Precisely for this kind of system where you can actually fight this error, it makes, yeah, yeah. It makes a difference. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Um, yes? Um, you know, as you're allowing more links to develop, as you, as you say, pooling the system, yeah. uh, is there a, a particular kind of network that you're constructing? I mean, how, is, is it a random network uh, that you're constructing? Yeah, actually, actually, when you cool when you cool the system the way I have it set up here, you just you just if if you know there's some probability that you will create an edge each turn, right? And that's what lambda is in this case. It's just are you going to create? I think it's lambda or it might be gamma. I don't. I forget. I can't. I can't even see it. But some parameter there. That's the cooling parameter. So that's just the probability that you will create one edge each turn. So it could be from zero to one. You pick them at random. Yeah, and then you stick them together. Yeah, so there's no like underlying structure to this to this system. It just emerges in this random way. Yeah. They cannot break in this version. Yeah, yeah. But these are great questions. <laughs> um, So actually, what I didn't show you, there's the little green line. So you're asking why do you create edges? So this is if everybody works independently. That's the performance of every single individual working independently to try to find the maximum, right? And the reason they do so poorly is because they all get trapped in these local minima here. So it's just like there's different graphs. Is it asking for a lot? So that is the landscape. This is representing the landscape. They they need to figure out the maximum amount. That is the groups. Actually, this is another, right? Yeah, that's right. So that's right. They're not the same. Yeah, that's right. That, yeah, these aren't people. These are solutions, and people are trying to find the best solution. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, all right, so that's all I'm going to tell you about the simulations. I want to show you real data. Um, but this is in, in the book that, that Henrik mentioned, which deals with all kinds of things like conspiracies and getting old and creativity and language evolution and stuff like that. Um, but I did make this particular chapter available. Um, and. I'll just put this up for a second, but if you want it. So this chapter is about group problem solving. Um, and so if you, if you like it, you can probably, you can find it on my website because I have it free on the book's website. So you can, you can, you can go there. And if you want any of the other chapters, you can see them all. Just email me, I'll send them to you. So this is just showing you that social proof and group polarization and herding, they tend to reduce individual exploration. And that's bad when problems are hard. And strategic and structural modification can ameliorate the problem somewhat. Maybe there's some optimal set of, of sort of tunings we could do. All right. So now I want to talk about competitive environments that are more like the one that you just did a little while ago, um, where the self and other are different from one another. And so what do people do in the prisoner's dilemma? Is there anybody? You all know what the prisoner's dilemma is, but just as a brief primer on the prisoner's dilemma, two people are trapped, and they're taken to separate rooms in the jailhouse, and they can either cooperate or defect. So defect means you say the other person did it, and cooperate means you keep quiet. If both people cooperate and keep quiet, that's the best outcome for, for, for both of them, unless one of them defects against the other person who cooperates. So it's best to be a defector against a cooperator, right? to say the other person did it and for them to be quiet. So classic game theoretic problem, here's the payoff structure here. So defection against a cooperator is the best thing for you and the worst thing for the other person. And the Nash equilibria is this solution here. So this is sort of the best response to a best response, which is defection in a one-shot prisoner's dilemma. We're only going to play the game once. What do you do? And the Nash equilibrium is for both of us to defect, which, of course, is horrible. But it's what a majority of economists do <laughs> when asked to play this game. Right? So this is some old, some old research from Frank and Gilovich. It's actually been shown several times now. Um, so here's economists. Uh, on the left, and you can see about 60% of them uh, defect. And here's everyone else, and about 60% of them cooperate. Right? Um, and this is funny, and I didn't believe it, but so I asked my, both of my economist friends. I've got a few more than two, but I asked two of my closest economist friends, like guys who I figured would take a bullet for me. They both said they would defect. Right? 
And then they had to explain it to me in many emails. In fact, now they're still explaining it to me. They said, for an economist, they're taught everything is in the payoff matrix. This, this incorporates everything. This incorporates my future relationship with you and everything like that. So for an economist, the payoff matrix, as they're taught, is this incorporates everything, right? OK, so then I asked them, why is economics education so bad that 40% of them still cooperate? <laughs> um, but, just saying. Um, but in any case, um, so all right, so that's really interesting. And that gets at these sort of two different worlds that we talked about earlier with Rousseau and Hobbes. Um, and what we, you know, in the traditional prisoner's dilemma, you've got two versions. One is this one-shot version where we just play once. And the, the, the sort of Nash equilibrium is to defect. And then you've got a repeated or iterated prisoner's dilemma where we're going to play multiple times together. And this is the one that Axelrod had his famous competition for, and that the winning strategy was Rappaport's tiff attack, right? which is you cooperate on the first try, and then you do what the other person does after that. Right? And there have been lots of variations on that since then, because it's just sort of a uh, who can come up with the best simulated strategy in the situation. So what we did is we tried to come up with a system that was more like the real world, where you can generally choose to have repeated play with people. And so we created what's called the optional prisoner's dilemma. And the optional prisoner's dilemma has this structure. right? It gives people the choice of rather to replay with the same partner so they can make their interactions either one shot or repeated. So it would be like me and Louis, <coughs> me and, me and Louis play. And if Louis defects and I cooperate, then I might be, I don't want to play with Louis again. And so we both have to sit on the sidelines while everybody else plays until they're done. Right? So it's not like I can just immediately find, or, or, or you know, I can immediately find another person to play with. So you, you forego play if you stop playing right? um, with one person. And so, and so does this result in stable, cooperative, and competitive equilibria emerging over time? So here's actually what you should do in this world. Right? So what you should do depends on the proportion of cooperators. So if you go back to that sort of Hobbesian Rousseau idea, if you think the world is full of cooperators and you're right, you should cooperate. If you think the world is full of defectors and you're right, you should defect. Yeah? So it really boils down to what you believe. And we've done lots of different variations of this. Um, here's you know, the best world to be in is to be a cooperator in a cooperative world. Because cooperators are going to stop playing with you if you're a defector. And then you just have to sit by yourself. And the best world to be in, or, you know, the, 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 well, sorry, not the best world. This is basically the worst world down here, where everybody's defecting against everybody. And the saddle right, is even closer to 0.25 down here. OK, so what do people actually do? Right? So we got, we actually, I think by now we've had several thousand people do this. Um, participants play a prisoner's dilemma game, or the optional prisoner's dilemma game. With every individual in their population, there's six people. So you're going to play it five times with the five other people, one pair at a time. And after playing one round and discovering the result of the game, both players are asked whether they want to play again with the same partner. So it's exactly the optional prisoner's dilemma I just described. And if they both choose to play again, then they play again with some probability. Because we wanted, this to, we wanted it to make sure you didn't know when the end last turn was going to be. Because that, that breaks the, the iterated prisoner's dilemma. So that needed to be probabilistic. And if either or both choose not to play again, the partnership ends, and they must wait for the other pairs to finish. And outcomes are incentivized by payments. In fact, all the rest of the experiments I show you, people get paid to play this. So people who spend a lot of time crowdsourcing, you know, their time crowdsourcing um, on, on these uh, big, large online platforms. All right, so this is just the proof of, of, of the, the, the manipulation. So on the left is what we predicted. On the right is people's actual payoffs. And you can see cooperators do best in a cooperative world. <laughs> And they do worst in a world full of defectors. But the saddle's in the wrong place. Right? Um, I don't quite know why that is. But here's, our, here's the, 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 uh, what defectors are doing. When there's more defectors, you should defect. When there's more cooperators, you should cooperate. OK, so what do you think is going to happen if I put people in this world, yeah? No, we just get six random people online, and we stick them together. So we use Otree, which is basically an online platform that allows us to put people together. Yeah. So why is the data not going? No, it was never happening that nobody would. It's, it's, there's no populations where everybody defects. 
Yeah. In fact, you can see that most people are cooperating most of the time. Yeah? Deborah? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, you got it. So that would be something like two people cooperating, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just, that's just that's the the, 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 the smallest group of of, def, of defectors, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Deborah. Well, the, on the on the left over here, the saddle is about 0.25, and over here it's about 0.6. So, like, if you were on the right, you should move to be more cooperative. If you're on the left, you should be more defective. It doesn't quite fit this, but this is this is just what would people get if they were a cooperator defector. This is what people are actually getting in this world, right? Um, based on repeated, so it could be I cooperate with you three times and then I defect, right? That kind of thing. So this is a bit more complicated than our actual data over here. Every, everyone over here is a pure cooperator or a pure defector in a given background. Yes. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what they're doing most of the time. Yeah, you, you got it. Yeah. Um, how many times are they playing? How many rounds are they playing? They'll just they just play with each other person in their group once effectively. So not just one time, but until they decide to stop playing or they're or they're kicked out with one sixth probability. Yeah. So you get to play a few times with somebody if they're cooperating with you. So we get to make create wealth together. And then you're paired up with somebody else. OK. So predictions about what the world's going to be like? What do you think is going to happen? Well, we, we're, going to put, we're taking people, the, the non-economists, actually, some of them might be economists. Probably most of them are not economists, because economists have real jobs, maybe. But the, the, the not, these are probably mostly non-economists, which means mostly people who are cooperate 60 or more percent of the time. So that's putting them over here on the right side of the distribution. So now what happens? Should we, should we evolve towards strongly cooperative communities? Right, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, Timo? I think in the, in the traditional actual companies, you really get uh, you don't have to track at a certain point because people were not forgiving for uh, defection. So then if one person started defecting at random, the other person sort of reciprocated that defection and just started Right. And so in that case, it was because the strategies weren't sufficiently, the simulated strategies weren't sufficiently forgiving. Yeah. Well, that's exactly like our people, right? So real people are also not sufficiently forgiving. Um, so basically across more than 1,000 people, so, so quite a number of groups, probably around 100 groups now, we see this. We see populations that start off wildly cooperative, so 75% of people, roughly, more than 75% of people who are cooperating in a group, but over time they become more and more full of defectors. Right? And that's true for each of these groups. It's also true for all of these groups. So the first one was, um, this is Warwick students. Uh, this is prolific participants in the UK. Um, we've got a sample from Osaka, which is also quite cooperative. Um, I'll say, so I don't know how this boils out when you run around the world, but for, our, for most of our British participants, you wind up with strong cooperation in the beginning and then defection over time. You do st you still wind up with a few groups, like this is a cooperative, yeah. seems to be, you know, right, cooperative equilibrium here and here, right? This one's sort of suffering under one defector, but they, they're, they're cool with that, right? Um, so this is quite fascinating. You can also look at when people change, right? So this is with the same partner, so if this is, so you, you, you both cooperate together, and now you, you're cooperating together about, you know, like not 100% of the time, because like I said, this is, I can play with you multiple times and then defect once. Yeah? So you're, you're cooperating with somebody who cooperates with you most of the time, and so you stay cooperating. But if they defect against you, if the person you're playing with defects against you, then 42 percentage points drop in cooperation. Right? So here's you playing with another person, defecting against a defector, and here's you defecting against a cooperator. 
So you don't increase your cooperation if you're defecting against a cooperator, but you do reduce your cooperation if you're defecting, sorry, if you're cooperating with a defector. This is the same partner, and this is the really damaging thing. Um, sorry, this is just extra information. This is a new partner. So you carry the legacy of the defection to the next person you play. You don't just reboot and go, ah, I used to be a cooperator, and now I'm still a cooperator. If someone defects against you, you carry it over. And so this is showing this basically 30% drop in cooperation. And here's a 10% increase in cooperation if you defect against a cooperator. And so you can do the math, right? And it's basically you're three times more likely to switch from cooperation to defection than from defection to cooperation. And so that's driving this sort of system or these systems into defection over time. So you're really quite, quite unforgiving of, of defectors. Yes? But can it converge into 60% if you go back and slide? It, it does seem to. And I wonder if that, so I don't, I, don't, I don't quite know, right? So it's hard to say. Yeah, 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 I know, I know what you mean. The, 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 it's, hard to, it's hard to know, right, what's going on there. I think this, that deserves bigger groups, right? So we kind of ran out of steam with six people um, here just because they, they have to be coordinated at the same time. But I think it's a good point, right? So what would happen if you let these things go over a long period of time? I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, maybe there is, maybe a few cooperators is enough to sustain, you know, cooperate. So you and I could cooperate in a group of defectors and maybe you and I would be like, yeah, okay, even though I don't know when I'm, you're arriving, when I do find you, it's still worth it to cooperate with you. Yeah. Because people don't know one another, or it's just completely anonymous. Yeah. So just to summarize this bit, right? So following can be asymmetric. So in the previous work, I showed you following. And here we've got asymmetric following in competitive games, right? Our results indicate this defection bias, which can destroy cooperative societies, even when cooperation is de facto sort of stable equilibrium. So we tried this a number of ways, including provi providing information about other people's performance. And defection still is quite robust. Right? So people move from cooperating towards defecting. Though, though maybe there's, there's, a, there's an so asymptote. You find a new partner and just then? Yeah, you don't, nobody carries a reputation. Yeah, you're just up against someone new. Yeah. Right. OK, so that's just you against one other person. So now if we move towards collective action problems like the one you did earlier, um, so the collective action problems typically are of this style where there's a group of people and they can put money into a common pool and it's multiplied by a certain amount and then shared back with everyone. And in this case, people will often not put their money into the pool, right? And then they wind up doing better because they get somebody else's multiplied money shared back with them. So sort of a, a version of the of tragedy of the commons in a way. Um, I'll show you a slightly different version, but first I want to show you this because we also look at meritocracy versus luck. So this, people like to write books about meritocracy and you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for us to believe that hard work produces you know, more productivity and better outcomes. Um, and if you look across um, different countries at social expenditures, so as percentage of GDP, this is earlier work from Asini. I'm not, sorry, Alessina. I'm not sure if this still holds, right? But in this particular data set um, from about 20 years ago, um, there's this sort of positive correlation, right? So the more you believe in luck as a society, that luck determines income, the more likely you are to give to social expenditure. Right? Whereas if you're um, like Korea down here, you think that luck doesn't have anything to do with it, and so you don't spend anything on social expenditure. Right? Um, whereas alternatively, here's Sweden, luck is more important, and you give more to social expenditure. Right? So it's not the, it's, economists made this, so you know, if you trust them. You can <laughs> Say again? Oh, that's nice. The more they believe in luck. Okay, that's quite good. <laughs> that's good. No, that's good. That's good. The more you give them money, the more they believe in luck. Oh, that's, that's, I like that. I like that. Um, then we need a natural experiment when we sort of, yeah. That's good. Yeah, sorry. You are going to ask me things I don't know the answer okay, to. Sorry, so, okay, so, okay. so the, the, the x-axis, I believe, is a, is a value survey. So they give these large surveys out to groups, thousands of people. That's right, yeah, yeah. How much do you believe that luck determines outcome? That's right, 
that's right. And then this, I think, I think this probably some of this data is from OECD, right? And so they're just they're just collecting data that's collected at a sort of a national level. Um, so this would suggest maybe that if you told people that their earnings, that they earned the money that they have, that they might be more stingy with it, right? Or if they were told that they got it by luck, they might be more freewheeling. Um, I'll just make a quick story short. We've never found that in our data. No, we found it once, but it's quite difficult to find. Um, so here's the problem that we use. So this is from Malinsky. It's called the threshold public goods game. It's exactly what you played earlier. Right? So in the threshold public goods game, participants give an initial endowment, and they're assigned to groups. They decide how much to contribute towards a group target over 10 successive rounds, so that's one variation. If the group achieves the target, players keep the remainder of their endowment. And if the group fails to achieve the target, each player loses their remaining funds with certain probability. And for you, the probability was one. So you, <laughs> you worked hard. I didn't ask about efficiency. So how, how efficient were groups at reaching exactly 11? Or did they overspend? Um, so <laughs> you were very efficient. Good, good. I would, ex I would only expect the best from a collective action <laughs> meeting like this one. Um, so we created a version of this, um, and basically it's, this, it's exactly the same kind of thing, right? So each player is given a certain amount of money, and if they, if they, this is how much they have left over after they reach the target. The target is 30 pounds, and then we actually paid them 250, right? And this person would have got 1250, and that person would have got eight pounds. Right? So it's pretty good money for about 15 minutes worth of work. Um, and if they fail to reach the target, they would lose their, their income 50, with a 50% chance. So they just lose it all with a 50% chance. Um, and so, uh, just quickly on the study design, so you're randomly assigned to groups of four. They complete an effort task, so we had them add up five-digit numbers. This has been in the, in, the, in the sort of experimental economics literature for a while, for five minutes. And then we told them they're rich or poor, so they get more or less income. And they're also either in a merit treatment or a luck treatment. So they're told that the money they get is based on the work they did, or they're told money doesn't have anything to do with the work you did. It's just given out at random. They also complete a pre-game questionnaire where we test comprehension and ask them what they think is fair. So before they completed the game, and I think this is actually quite the interesting part, what do you think is fair? How much should you give? And they're even given a, a, a comprehension test. So they tell us how much has to go into the middle, they know how much each person has, and they have, to, they have to pass that in order to go to the what do you think is fair question. This is quite important when I show you what people think is fair. So they then start the collective action social dilemma, and they play over 10 rounds, and they can invest up to 20 monetary units in each round. And the final earnings are converted into pounds, and they know this. All right, so 60 groups, 240 people. This is just looking at fairness. Um, and I'm going to show you fairness in several different ways. So fairness here is just divided. Here's the rich, here's the poor, and I've just split it, or, or Eugene, I should say, has just split it into whether it's progressive. So should the poor pay less than the rich? Is it regressive, which means the poor pay more than the rich, proportionally, right? Or is it equal? Should they both pay the same amount? And you can think about this for yourself when you played the game, right? If you were a poor person and you knew there had to be 11, did you think, oh, I will give half of my wealth? If they give half of their wealth, we'll be close, right? Or should I give a quarter of my wealth and they should give three? So we'll be closer, more equal at the end, right? So, so we'll be at the same place at the end, right? Um, and you can see across all three treatment groups, you see this repeatedly. Right? The rich say it's regressive. The poor should pay for it, basically. Right? The not the majority, but more of them. Right? And the poor say it's progressive. Right? The poor people should pay less. What happens when you actually look at the data? So this is just showing fairness isn't enough. Um, this is still their, their fair fairness decisions. And here, all, I'm wanted, all I really want you to look at, because the different treatments aren't actually different from each other. In fact, in all the data I show you today, Merit and luck doesn't matter. Um, this is the dotted line is the mean contribution required to achieve the target. And you will notice that people's fair assessments 
are consistently below that line. So if you ask people what's fair to give, fair isn't enough to meet the, the collective good, right? the threshold. Right? They say something that's just below that. So first I showed you that it's self-interested. The poor say progressive. The rich say it's regressive. Then you add up them together. Or even if you take one person, what they say, fairness isn't enough. It's almost like they forgot what they just told us a second ago about what it would take to do it. But then if you look at what they say is fair for themselves and what the rich people in their group say is fair for them, I say they. If the poor person and the rich person, and you add it together, it's not enough. So what people say is fair isn't sufficient. So this is self-serving biases in fairness, and it might as well be a law. Right? And the reason I say that is because it's found frequently across all different kinds of studies. So if you... If you um, so Babcock and Lowenstein looked at it in negotiation. So what would be a fair split of 100 pounds between me and you? And you say something like 51 pounds for you and 49 for me, right? And so you add it together, and it's never enough, right? Um, obviously, you can, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can make it a little bit more complicated than that. Um, victim perpetrator dynamics, Baumeister showed this, right? So if you see one person hurting another person, and, you're, and you hear their story, you, know, you hear the perpetrator's story. Right? It was an accident. I didn't mean to hit them. You know, when you hear the victim story, like, they've always done this to me. They keep treating me like this. Right? You know, and so you see that imbalance and sort of this imbalance in object objectivity, I think. Right? And so there's lots of different kinds of evidence for this. And we see it here in what's roughly a kind of climate change analogy. Right? So we, we create a problem that's sort of like climate change. And people are just going, I think it would be fair for us to reduce carbon, you know, greenhouse gas emissions by this amount, and for you to reduce it by this amount, and it's nowhere near the agreed target of, you know, two degrees. So I think this is quite uh, damning. This is showing you that merit and luck doesn't really matter. In this case, we've got the uncertain treatment doing best, but it doesn't, I don't, I don't want to dwell on this because this seems to be variable. Um, here's showing you what's the difference between the rich and the poor. And on the top, um, this is the absolute contribution. So rich people pay more across rounds. So this is, this is rounds here from 1 to 10. This is merit, uncertain, and luck. So split by treatments, again, doesn't really matter. Um, the poor people are paying less. The rich people are paying more in absolute terms. But in proportional terms, the poor pay more of their wealth proportionally. And that might have happened in your groups earlier. Right, the poor people paid more. I know that you, pay, you as a poor individual. <laughs> so, sorry, right? so the poor people pay more. Um, and this is the Gini coefficient. So I showed you the Gini coefficient earlier with inequality. So if the Gini coefficient is going up, then that means there's more inequality afterwards. And so here is the pregame Gini coefficient, this little dotted line. And basically, successful groups, they're successful because the poor people pay for it. Right? Yeah? Yeah. It's sort of, it, it could feel like quantitative easier, not giving anything. So mm. even capital, maybe if it was more fine grained, maybe in the thermodynamic limit is somehow adjusted, or is it actually an effect? Because maybe that thing of not contributing at all, it's a bit of a... Yeah, no, I get you. I, I get you. I, and I don't disagree, actually. So especially in your particular situation, that might have had an influence yeah. on some of you. Um, Probably that experiment. The way, the way sort of... Uh, behavioral scientists, when they look at this kind of thing, they'll often say, oh, well, they only had three choices, and so people tend to take the middle choice. And so you need to split it up in lots of different ways in order to show that it's not something, about, an artifact of the way you design the experiment. Yeah. So, so I don't disagree with you in that particular, in that particular instance. Yeah. Um. So in this study, there's only 260 people. And they just play one game of 10 rounds with another set of three people. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like the merit luck thing here is a bit weak. 
but we've done it again somewhere else, and we still don't find it. In fact, I'm going to show you another case where we did it with 5,000 people around the world, and we like merit and luck. Whatever, whatever people, so merit and luck tends to slightly influence what people say is fair, but once you get them playing the game, they don't care anymore. I'm wealthy, I'll keep it, right? It's like, or, you know, or whatever, right? So once you get people actually playing the game, what they say ahead of time doesn't seem to be a strong predictor of what they actually do. No? Did, did you tell them it's merit or luck before they did the effort test or after? Oh, that's a good question. I think they're told before. I think they're told before. Yeah, yeah, I think they're told before. Okay. And does it actually, I'm not 100% sure about that. Does it actually matter on their yeah, it does depend on their performance. Okay. So you actually do. Yeah, it's true. If, if, if we told them it depends on merit, then it does. Okay. It does. Um, but obviously, we couldn't peop get people from using calculators or things like that because it's all done online. But still, you know, they're told. If you get more right, then you will, you will you know, so, yeah. Um, so here's, the, this, this is the third study. I'm going to show you one more. I don't know how much time I have. Um, probably I should finish soon, yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. So I'll show you one more thing. So this is, this is just fairness is not enough. So people make self-serving objective fairness evaluations in unequal societies. The poor tend to pay proportionally more. And this increases inequality. Um, and I'll just show you one more thing. Um, so what happens if you add private solutions? Right? So we've got, we've got self-serving and collective action problems. But really, in most of the Western world, if I want to, pr to protect myself from flooding, I just buy a house on a hill, right? I don't have to worry about you know, this kind of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's other people's problem, right? Effectively, I can buy a private solution. Um, and this is just showing you the, this is the hurricane in, in New York in 2012. Um, and Goldman Sachs building is the only thing that's lit up as the entire city is, is dark because they have their own generators and they've also got a wall um, that they've built around the building. Um, there's lots of examples of private solutions. Uh, and in fact, this, I think this is on the right, this is data from OECD, which is showing that uh, basically climate mitigation is, is falling and adaptation, spending on adaptation is increasing. So this is basically means sort of like private, private solutions, right? We're looking at ways to sort of like deal personally with climate change. And um, if we've got the money to do it, we can. Here's just super rich people buying uh, underground shelters. Um, in the, U in the UK, you're seeing more and more of private bobbies. So these people who buy um, basically local security teams for their neighborhood uh, to sort of wander around looking like bobbies. And then you also saw it during the pandemic when the rich countries are sort of hoarding the COVID vaccine. So again, private solutions in lots of different contexts. Um, so you can make an ex a public goods game that also allows people to buy private solutions. So just like the one we did earlier, but now let's just imagine that the private solution costs three units, and you protect yourself. Right? So um, this is just showing that as the cost of the private solution goes up, that uh, people are, so this is cost-benefit ratio of the individualism. Um, so this, more people are going to buy the private solution if it's cheaper. Right? And this, again, is just the cost of the private solution going up, and sorry, successfully created public goods go down over time. So people stop investing in the public good when there are private solutions in this context. And um, this is that's just to remind you of that. I'm actually just going to show you what we did here. Um, this is the public goods game, now with a private solution that costs a fixed amount, and you can buy it yourself. And what we've done here, so it's basically the same rules as before. Uh, we've still got wealth inequality, so we've still got rich and poor. And we've run this in 35 different countries now, so with about 5,000 um, people. That's why all those list of collaborators at the beginning, um, because those are the 70 odd collaborators associated with this. So the merit and luck, I'll just quickly summarize this. The merit and luck treatments don't matter. Again, we don't find this. Like telling people that you earned your money or you got it from luck, doesn't matter. Um, so we combine overall treatments. So did wealth matter for private solution? Of course it did. Rich people buy the private solution, and they invest less in the public good when they do it. Uh, and this, the blue lines are showing you how often the poor people buy the private solution. 
which is not really predicted. In fact, we've looked at lots of different um, sort of cross-cultural variables trying to predict this. So here's Indonesia, here's the UK, here's the Dominican Republic, here's China. We, we haven't been able to predict any of this with any kinds of cross-cultural variables like collectivism or different Hofstetter's value surveys or whatever else. Like the private solution really tends to like throw a wrench into the whole sort of being able to predict what culturals are going to do. I'm going to show you this again in a slightly different way. Um, sorry, I'm going to skip over this. This is because I want to get to, there you go. That's a better, that's a better picture. This is how often each society um, reached the, so this is the mean success rate for the shared solution. Right, so here's Greece, which did quite well for the shared solution. The absolute poorest was the Warwick student population here. Um, luckily, there's another UK general population here, which makes this look slightly less bad. Um, but you'll be able to find yourself on here somewhere. These are all university students, by the way, um, from different universities around the world. So I call them like future leaders, right? You know, it's not an indigenous population somewhere in some place or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it's students that are going to university. But you can see there's huge diversity here. You get the same fairness results. So fairness is not sufficient for a large majority of the groups, right? So most, and it's not predicted by country. So when you ask people what's fair, they don't tell you, they don't, they don't give you values that are sufficient to meet the, 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 um, the threshold. The rich people say what's fair is for them to pay less. The poor people say what's fair is for them to pay less. Right? Um, you do see a little bit of modest relationship between merit and luck beliefs uh, and social and private solutions. So this is country level uh, belief in luck determining success. And here's the shared solution success. So if you believe more in luck, you're slightly more likely to I, the statistics are not good, right? So the effect sizes here are going to be super tiny. Um, so I, I, would, I don't think this holds any, any merit. Um, yeah. uh, this is just to show you at group level, we can see belief in individual responsibility predicting people buying the private solution, right? Um, but not at the country level. And then I think I wanted to show you, uh, so this is just inequality results, which goes up in every country. The poor are footing it, right? The poor pay for this um, across every single country. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, and this is successful groups. This is unsuccessful groups. So even in unsuccessful groups, the inequality is going up. So they're spending to try to reach a target or buying public private solutions or whatever else, and inequality is widening, as I suspect it did even in here. Um, so what people said versus what they did. So on the left here, this is what is fair for rich, poor players to contribute. This is what they said. So, every, so this is just averaging across everyone. Everyone agrees that it's slightly better if the rich pay a little bit more than the poor. Pretty equal here. This is what they actually did. So here's the poor people paying. Uh, this is towards the shared, this is the shared solution. The poor people are paying for it, and the rich are opting for the private solution even though they said it would have been fair for them to do it. So oh, it's just cheap talk, right? So, so this is an issue with a lot of psychological experiments. If you're just asking people, or surveys, economic surveys, where you're just asking people stuff, right? the issue is that it's, it could potentially cheap talk. Right? As soon as you give them money or resources or whatever else, what do they actually do when they're in these contexts? Um, what does predict success? This is quite interesting. Uh, this is probably the best, the best result we have so far. So this is the mean group contribution to the shared solution in round one. And this is the shared solution success rate over here on the left. So this is showing that if people gave a lot in round one, that actually predicts they're going to be successful. And then I'm, I'm circling back to the beginning of this talk. Right? Because the question is, what are we signaling if we're, what's happening if I'm giving a lot? to the public good, right? And here's basically the answer, right? So this, is, this graph, which I'll explain, is showing you basically following. People are doing what other people in their group do, and they also show defection bias at the same time, right? So this is if I give less than I increase, if I gave less than the average, so this is difference between my contribution and the average group contribution on the previous round. 
So if I gave less than the average, I'll give slightly more. So if every peop every other people in my group gave, but I didn't, I'll give more, a little bit. But if I gave more than the average, and other people gave less than me on average, then I reduce my contribution by a lot. Right? So this is, again, the social following, or the social influence, with the asymmetric um, sort, of, sort of influence here. This is just on the first round. Sorry, this is, this is what people do on round two. So after seeing what happens on round one, this is across all rounds over here. All right, so conclusions. I've shown you lots of, couple, lots of different things. Collective action problems, we've got collaborative problems and competitive problems. We've got trade-offs like exploration and exploitation and self versus other, which seem to play out in all these different kinds of things. Social proof matters for all of them. Um, and these asymmetric biases favoring the self, both in fairness, judgments, and in actions, and they're compounded dramatically by inequality and also by private solutions. So, and that is it for me. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we have uh, now some time for discussion. Maybe I can start a little bit and then I can give the mic over to you. So um, this was uh, really interesting. It's all, so <clears throat> I will start with an anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> Long time ago, before anyone in the social sciences knew about network science, this was around 1993. Uh, um, um, then, I went to a PhD course in rational choice. Uh, we did the regular game theoretical things, but it was one thing was different. And it was this uh, book by George Sebelius called Nested Games. And it was the first time I encountered, and many encountered, the idea that people are involved in many games simultaneously. And that also, I think, I come to think about that because I think about these different levels, like micro, meso, macro. And people are not only involved in one game. They're not only play Prison's Dilemma with people. They're not only involved in that. They're involved in many different games that can affect the payoffs and how they behave, depending on what games they're actually involved in, if we now allow ourselves to say that people are involved in games. So how do you see this, that people are actually not only as playing a Prison's Dilemma, they're involved in many different circumstances that can impact them and so on. All the information are not only in the description of the game. So, are, so is the question basically, are people playing different kinds of games all the time? Yeah, and how, how, how does that relate to doing this in the lab? And you have the people doing one thing. And oh, yeah. Like, and then how do we translate that into uh, interventions, actions out in the real world when mm. we have all of these different factors, mm. different games that people are involved in all the time? Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a really good criticism, right? Like any, anybody's field in here, you're taking a specific angle and you've got to simplify it in order to be able to make any progress in that particular angle. And experimental psychologists, and I sort of count myself among them because my students do experiments. <laughs> but the, the, I think it, ha it has something to contribute. It controls different kinds of things. And then we can kind of manipulate that experimental system to see what really matters for people. Right? So for example here, the introducing private solutions and showing that it's so detrimental across all these different countries, I feel like that's kind of powerful. That says something that's probably true that we could probably find in lots of different contexts. Um, but I think we still need these other types of information as well, right? We still need simulations and theorists and qualitative researchers to sort of suss out what all the details are. So uh, on that note, um, you talked about these two different worlds. What would you say, what can we, what can we do to move from one world to another? What, <laughs> what do you see the leverage points in human behavior, institutions, norms, and whatever you can think of? Yeah, and that's what, kind of what we're thinking about now, right? So, so now that we've got this platform that sort of works, then the question is how can we move people uh, in the system? And so I sort of mentioned a couple of things in passing that we tried, say, for example, with the prisoner's dilemma, with the optional prisoner's dilemma, um, where we basically tried telling them how good other people are doing. Right? And that didn't seem to have much of an effect. Right? So seeing that other people are doing better than them, there's still a bias towards defection in this context. Um, we're trying some manipulations now with uh, these collective action problems. Um, and you can, you can think of lots. I think this is a place where you get to be creative. right? So you get to think, like, what kinds of things might influence people? And so you could ask questions like, for example, um, what if you prime people with certain kinds of information? Like, 
One, one question that I like to ask people at like dinner tables is if, if there could be only be one totalitarian ruler of the world, who would it be? Who would you choose? Right? And this tells you a lot about people, but they also tend to choose somebody who they think is wise. Right? And then you could say, after you prime them with this, you could say, okay, how would that person, how might that person act in this context, in this situation? That you're Must in? it be a living one or can it be a... It can be a dead one if you like. Yeah, okay. I, choose, anyone. I choose Carolus Rex, Swedish king. Okay. <laughs> It became, it it became yeah. king when he was 50 years old and conquered Europe and whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, maybe you have some... Uh... I'm happy to make a short comment, a question. <clears throat> to me, uh, you, you started the talk with that, that picture of kids imitating one another. And I, I think this is a real deep thing that we don't think about um, enough, perhaps. And I see this as a parent as well. We, we think very much about what we tell our kids, but really what matters is what we do and they just imitate. And mm. it's, it's a very deep thing that I often find myself struck that, that people don't think about enough. And I'm thinking about this also in the context of, of society where uh, also thinking about the, the games that you showed, there are, there are so many examples that we know now where you can prime behavior simply by signaling. Uh, and we seem to not think about this enough. I'm thinking, for instance, of the kind of news that... Uh, we are exposed to, which very, very uh, rarely um, displays the kind of cooperative behavior that we would imitate if we, if we saw enough of it. Mm. Uh, but we just don't see enough. Instead, what we see is the kind of shocking, disgusting stuff that I, I think y your, your kind of research uh, shows that can destroy uh, our ability to cooperate. And so um, I'm curious whether you see ways, whether, first of all, if you think that it's indeed relevant what we signal uh, in, in driving and engineering cooperation in society, and if you see ways that we could actually act on that concretely um, to alter the, the landscape of cooperation through perceptions. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So I think it's really cool, right? So, so I have a lot of thoughts about this. So one of them is, like, I think Hannah Arendt talks about this, right? If we, if we remove civic communities... Um, it's, perfect, it's a perfect feeding ground for totalitarians who can just feed you through the little box in your home, right, the information they want you to see. So if we remove you know, whatever news we don't want you to see and we just show you the news we do want you to see, it's a perfect feeding ground for totalitarians <laughs> if you don't have social connections that keep you informed. Right? So the downfall of civic communities sort of create a sort of environment. This isn't quite an answer to the, 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 the following question, but it's sort of like, what do we see? Right? And so like... This leads to another observation, which I'm curious if other people have had this or have any thoughts about this. So I try to read lots of different news sources only because I'm dreadfully curious and I feel like I'm being myopic if I just look at you know, The Guardian or CNN or something like that. Right? So I look at Fox News. And whenever I see Fox News, I see certain kinds of things. And I also look at China Daily. Right? And whenever I look at China Daily, China Daily has a really positive view on the world. Right? So they, they share a much more positive perspective. And I know this is weird, right? So and I'm, I'm not su I'm suggesting that we all become like readers of China Daily. But my point, is, my point is quite plain, right? Which is that Fox News, the valence of Fox News is really negative, right? And the valence of China Daily is very positive. Right? And so that just sort of gets to the question. And we've, done, we've actually done a little bit of research on news sources and the types of signals they're sending out in different countries, right? And so then that leads to the question, Right? It's like, what, what's the, what, 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 how do you decide what the truth is to share right? in, in a news source? And how do you decide what the weighting should be? Or do you let the market decide? Right? So if people are clicking on things, should they be able to click on negative things? Should they be able to click on positive things? In the, in the, the dark side of information proliferation paper that I talked about earlier, people are really drawn to negative things. And so if you give them the option to see negative things, they will they'll see it, right? They'll look for it and they'll click on it. Um, and that drives up you know, the, negative, the negative valence in the system quite a lot. And yeah, so I, I, I'm torn, right? I feel like it's really valuable that we show our kids and we show one another positive messages, but at the same time, where does the control come from in the system? Yeah. Relatedly, you talked about uh, social annealing and social annealing, if I understand, is a way to disconnect uh, so that we can be more creative in the solutions we find. Mm. And so... Again, do you see ways that this could or should be part of 
social design or societies? What, what steps do you take beyond your academic research in, in thinking about social annealing in society? What, what could it look like? What should it look like? It's, it's dangerous to talk about it out loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're being I'm, recorded on it. Yeah, I'm being taped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. At, I mean, it's, it's funny. I, was, I, there, I just met one of the people here who was for the, the APS, the, the Physics Society, yesterday, and she was talking about the future of physics and like education and these kinds of things. Um, and, and I said, well, my kids were homeschooled. Right, they were home educated up until, for my son, up until about the point he was 13, right? And then he went to school. And so my first two daughters, just purely home educated, then they went into the system, and they've done okay, right? You know, they've done well, right? Um, and my son, he, he, being in the social system where he sees lots of other people doing things, I think the home education worked up until about 13, right? Because he's still, he's still a decent person. But the, 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 the um, I'm headed somewhere. The, the, uh, the partly the question about, like, she was from South Africa, and so partly the question was, how do you use AI systems in South Africa? How might that enrich the educational environment? And what's cool about AI, as we all know, is that you can create a personalized educational system, right? And so now you can create educational systems that are highly personalized to what individual children want to know, or what you as a, as a business leader want to know. And then, of course, you risk the annealing, right? You know, it's like unless you build the annealing into the AI, right? So you've got people doing what they want to do and learning what they want to learn, but the, the coming together part might be missing. So it's fascinating. Although I will, I'll still stand up for my kids. They've managed to come together in their own ways, but you know, I still, <laughs> I think there's a risk there. Yeah. yeah. Let's have questions from the room. Yeah. I want to go back to that uh, earlier comment about perceptions. And uh, so there's actually, ter so it turns out there's a bit of somewhat less pro profound, but there's a place that this was tried and sort of worked. And that was, uh, that was like file sharing, Napster. So Say it again, what was Napster, it? Napster, okay, or yeah, like yeah. these file, share file sharing apps, which is basically like, a, you know, these are apps where peer, everybody like makes their, you know, music files and movie files and so on available. So like torrents, torrents. Which yeah, is torrents there. and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can download stuff, but someone has to make, upload stuff to make, to make it possible to download. So it's a cooperative fact, and there's no benefit for you to upload stuff, but there's benefit from downloading, right? Um, so it turns out a lot of these apps actually um, lie to people about how many people were sharing, how much other people were sharing. They either, they either sort of obfuscated how, many, how much other people were sharing, or just straight up like everybody's sharing. Just oh, lie right. to people. Okay. And that's how they kind of got it going for a while, at least. And so we, have a, we, have a, we did a little model of this. Because the problem here, of course, is like people are not, if you're trying to download music and you can never find files, you're going to wise up to it. If, if, you, know, they, you can't lie forever, right? So that's the problem in that. So, so it turns out, and this is sort of gets back to your comment about, um, you, you made a point about like, you know, information, giving people information doesn't help. In fact, what we find actually withholding people or making it hard for people to learn the actual rate of cooperation while also signaling that everybody's cooperating actually can help because, okay. because it sort of makes sort of this sort of creates this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy essentially. And then it becomes, it starts out as a lie, but it becomes so true enough that, you know, you, you end up in a cooperative community. So I, I don't know if that's been tried. I don't think that's been tried like elsewhere. And of course, Napster and all those file sharing apps were shut down because of legal. By the way, this is this, this, we got this idea from a legal paper, actually, a, a law review paper, um, which I can find a reference for. But, and they called it the charismatic code. Uh, and the, the code there was not like a code of law or code of norms. Mm -hmm. It was literally the code of the file sharing app that get, told, you, told you how much you know, people were sharing. And it was bias in a way that made you to make you I see. share more. But so. you, in your experiment, you hide the amount of sharing that's going on. Well, this, uh, it's, it was a model, yeah. So, okay. But we, we basically like told people, you know, we model a, a scenario where people are told like, oh, this, this proportion is, you know, sharing, even regardless of whether they're actually sharing or not. Yeah. Uh, and then you can get equilibria where that proportion is actually sharing and that it becomes true. But, but the signal itself is not related to the truth I see. initially. 
but you can get also various other dynamics. So just wanted to make that point. Like, so, so this sort of, there was sort of this earlier internet ecology before like it, got, it all got taken over by platforms that created all these sort of like experiments, like natural experiments for cooperation in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, so this was like one of the interesting ones that we studied. Yeah, that's cool. So I was going to ask about, uh, earlier you were talking about the private solutions seem to be the, the option most chosen. And the question is, can you transition out of it? In relation to that, we are seeing, for example. Sorry, sorry what's the question? Can you uh, read? So the, uh, I was asking about the, the uh, situation right now where you're, well, you're finding that private solutions seem to be the uh, most opted way for the rich. Mm. And the question that arises is, do you see ways for them to move out of that in relation to a particular problem at least we're seeing in, in, in the Philippines right now? So if you look at, you know, people are saying there's a lot of traffic and congestion gets worse and worse with vehicles on the road. Yet you see an increase as well in the purchases of SUVs. Mm. Cars are getting bigger and bigger right. because there are more flooding or, you know, uh, it, it just, the air conditioning is better, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you see people, you know, moving out of that state because getting that SUV is fairly expensive. It's a private solution that has an initial capital outlay that is, that's very high. And so is there really something like walking that back? Is there something like walking that back? Yeah. Um, we, we sort of talk, we mentioned it a little bit over lunch um, with Helga. So, so Naomi Oreskes said this to me, and I still love this idea, which so I'll share it with you all. So I asked her um, at, at dinner last summer um, uh, when she came to Max Planck, the, the, the question was, if you could change anything in society, what would it be? Right? And she said she would remove subsidies, right? Because subsidies make beef cheaper, they make fuel cheaper, right? They, they, they lead to all these knock-on effects, which make it probably, in many cases, they make it cheaper for rich people to do you know, a lot of things that, that are not good for them. And I don't, I don't mean to say rich in a negative way, right? You know, it's like we're all rich here. Um, if you're here, you're probably rich in a relative sense. Um, but I, I just mean that they make it cheaper for people to do things that we actually have preferences against collectively, or should have preferences against collectively. So I think that might be a way to walk back um, some of these things, right? You don't subsidize things that you don't want people to do. Um, and that, that might be a kind of solution. But I, think, I feel like that, that could be very dramatic, obviously. And so, she know, I'm susp I'm, my, my suspicion is that she knows a lot more about it than I did, right? So um, she's the author of Merchants of Doubt, right? Um, as Helga reminded me earlier. Um, so, but she, she, you know, I, think, I think that's kind of an interesting way to think about it, right? So this is talking about incentivizing things. If you're subsidizing things, you don't, if you're incentivizing things you don't want people to do, then that you might want to try to change the subsidies or the incentivization scheme. Yeah, I'm not. A, take one or two more questions. So, who is going to have the honor? Can we come to a cooperative solution? <laughs> okay. <laughs> just go. Just go for it. I'll I'll, I'll answer it quickly. Or you sure can just... one. Um... Back to Hendrik and the kind of um, application of this to real situations and the fact that we play a lot of games, that's true. But th what I would say is the, the most complicated thing is that we don't have a real consciousness about the payoff matrix. Mm. So we don't know it and we don't know the consequences of our acts yeah. because we don't have the information. I mean, if, if I were, suppose I, I'm in the college, so I'm going to talk about the biodiversity thing. If I were to a supermarket and I, I could choose between a particular kind of uh, thing that has a huge impact on biodiversity and something else that has a minor impact on biodiversity and climate change and whatever, I might eventually choose that thing, even though I don't like it much as the other, you know, because I'm aware of the consequences. So I've, I was wondering if uh, the battle for having uh, re reduced misinformation, more fidelity in transmission of information, and better information would actually be something that you would say is important to actually to improve 
agency in society. Right. So, so signal the, re the, the true costs of things. Right. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I think that's, that's yeah, I, I'll get 100 behind that 100%. Right? And then it's just a question of like, how are we going to decide what the true cost <laughs> is? <laughs> My truth. <laughs> that's okay, right. Maybe it's soon time for a coffee. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.